webinar, a radio webinar, immigration webinar on Wednesday, every Wednesday with uh, Lucas Garrison. So everyone is busy last uh, 15 days. Everyone be gathering the all information and documentation and uh, submit submitting to the attorneys. I think attorneys are very busy. We are not responding on them. So we hope to uh, get uh, uh, the process of who, whoever fall into the applying 485. So is busy. So today's session is still going to discuss the October visa bulletin and uh, the process 485 process. And uh, we are already in middle of week, middle of month. 15, maybe maybe next couple of days, maybe not uh, not more than 20, October 20, new visa bulletin will come over. So everyone eye on the November visa bulletin, the dates will change or still continue or maybe it move forward. The everyone eye on November visa bulletins, uh, we can discuss on that one. So last week, the October 7, the October 6, the USC has changed on H1B, the new rules, fees, and uh, approval limitations. And uh, LCA, permanent LCA uh, changes. And uh, we can discuss if you have any questions, and uh, Lucas is ready to give the answers on that one. So, Lucas, welcome to Telugu and Nara Radio immigration webinar session welcome today thank you uh thank cat how are you doing well uh thanks for having me it's been a busy week since we last spoke yeah so it means, uh, i i know it means, uh, the attorneys are very this this uh, october month is very precious uh, you you need to handle all cases without any error so uh, that is a high priority to to you. We understand you were, even though you are giving one hour to Telugu Radio, we thankful thankful to you. So yeah, we are already in um, mid of uh, month. What did you see last fifteen days? How is uh, moving the four eighty five process? Well, um, you know. We've had to uh, prioritize our work, so we not only <clears throat> continue with our normal business with, uh, you know, non-immigrant visas, primarily H-1Bs or, you know, perm processes, but now we're also, you know, handling the influx of uh, adjustments. You know, as far as uh, our office goes and other attorneys' offices, you know, there's a certain threshold that once you get to, uh, you know, a certain amount of cases, you have to manage that and, you know, I know some attorneys are already uh, saying that they can't accept any other cases at this moment because of the, you know, the responsibility to make sure we get all the cases uh, complete and filed on time. Uh, you know, we're set up. We can still we have the bandwidth to take more cases. But, um, you know, I would like to just go ahead and start the show today just by saying uh, it's important not to wait too long uh, to get your cases uh, started if you if you do want to file because. You know, if you can imagine, there's already other people in the process of uh, working on their case. And, um, you know, attorneys typically work first in, first out. So, um, you know, I know some people, I've spoken to probably 15 or 20 people that were waiting on the new visa bulletin to be posted to make a decision whether or not they want to downgrade or see if EB2 moves close. And, you know, which is fair, but you just have to remember that, um, you know, once we get close to the... The finish line at the end of the month if the dates change or the filing uh, permissions change from USCIS on what cases they'll uh, accept you know we might have uh, an issue where some people might want to file and not might not have the opportunity so it's important to have that communication open with uh, whichever attorney you're going to work with and make sure that they know that you're still thinking about the case or you can get updates on uh, when you need to make an actual decision on if you want to start the case or not. Here. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much. Uh, the brief information last week and last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So, Edmund, uh, you already 
point out um, they were the downgrade. I hear uh, from my friend circle, some friend circle, the some some H1 holders are waiting for the November visa bulletin because the whoever the hedge after 2007, 2011 May, maybe June, July, August, or maybe uh, January, January 2012, they are waiting for the November visa bulletin. If next next month it move for next uh, next. Of six months or seven months forward, they are they are not uh, they are okay to file in next month in regular process. They, it, it will not require to downgrade and uh, uh, involve all this process. That is pretty. They, they, it will be pretty straightforward process. So, what is the expectation of next uh, November visa bulletin dates? Will move forward or retrogation? Do you have any? insight on that one? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. That's a topic we've been discussing quite a bit with, you know, the people who've inquired about opening a case and who might be on that borderline uh, EB2 filing date uh, with their priority date. And I just want everyone to remember that as we progress through this uh, first month uh, where the visas have been reallocated from family-based to employment-based, you know, these are projections on on how many cases there might be. That there's a that that's how the filing dates or the final action dates, you know, be, move to see how how many cases are there, how many pending I-140s have already been filed for this category from this country, and what could happen and what has happened in the past is, let's say, the State Department issues November bulletin. Okay, and EB2 moves up two months or something like this. Well, USCIS might have received such an influx of cases of applications that were filed in the month of October that for November to prevent, you know, all these additional cases to keep pouring in, they, the USCIS might say, well, you have to reference, you know, the final action date for that visa category, uh, which could put everyone back instead of anticipating, you know, even if the, the visa bulletin says, you know, EB2 moves up to the end of the year, USCIS might say, well, we're only going to accept cases that have actual final action dates. So that would be the 2009 uh, date uh, if that if it's the states in, around the same area. Um, so that's another thing. We don't know what's going to happen. So even if you see the visa bulletin, once USCIS sits there, uh, uh, schedule of what they will accept that very could well be just the final action date and then we would just be waiting until USCIS allows us to file in the future. Okay so as of now we don't have any concrete uh, information right? Correct but I would I would be very suspicious to, to plan on waiting till November to file because um, if USCIS receives so many cases, they're automatically going to say, you know, let's use the final action date uh, while they're processing this, the influx of all the cases received in October. So even if the we wait it until next week and we see the new visa bulletin, um, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that we can file in November because the final action date uh, might be referenced rather than the filing date uh, like what we're uh, based on right now. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Lucas, I want to go to the next uh, point to downgrade EB2, EB3 about I-140. So, it means most of the H1 holder got the information from different attorneys and different forum. There's still, it meant a lot of confusion, right? So, uh, it means I hear the employer initially said that, hey, we can go for apply. Maybe we can go for downgrade uh, EB2, EB3. After 15, 15, 14 days, they said that um, their decision made did not go for downgrade to EB, EB3 to EB3. What is the reason behind that one? Is there any issue while downgrade to EB3 to EB3, EB2, EB3 for I-140? Do you have any information, additional information on that one? 
are you referring if, like why the uh, employer might not uh, yes. downgrade? Yes. Well, it depends. So if you're a former employee and you're going back to the employer who filed your uh, I-140 and you're going to ask them to downgrade from EB-2 to EB-3, you're, you're still having to show the ability to pay. So if this employer has 20 other people or 10 other people uh, and the prevailing wages are all, let's say, 80K on average, so for 10 people at 80K, they have to show $800,000 in additional profit to file. So some employers might not have the financial means to show that they have the assets or cash available to, to support that position. So, um, you know, that that's one thing to consider. Another thing to consider might be some employers want you to, you know, come back and work for the six months. <laughs> You know, while while everything's being processed, uh, you know, and so there's many different reasons for that. Um, I I don't know of any other major reason why someone would or would not. Uh, a, again, the employer has to agree that the proffered position is going to exist. Uh, you know, when the GC is issued, so um, maybe a position's no longer available, for example. So that could be one of the reasons as well. So it means so if we downgrade to EV2, EV3, it means we need to apply the fresh I-140 on existing perm, old perm. So if we apply the fresh I-140, I, I, want, I, want I think UCS will check all details. Maybe they will investigate all information based on the previous uh, uh, perm details. So what is the potential risk to here while uh, uscs uh, investigation every information aspect of company employer employee related is there any chance to uh, deny the i-140 cases in these cases uh, some some are suspecting it means in this scenario some of some of the h1 holders not trying to downgrade eb2 to eb3 is it true well, I mean, every case is going to be adjudicated uh, by USCIS to make sure that all the evidence is complete. They're going to look at the totality of the evidence to make sure they meet the threshold of the preponderance of the evidence standard, which means more likely than not, the employer uh, has offered the position that they can support the position, that the employee has the required credentials for the position and that the finally that the employer has the ability to pay the proffered wage to the employee. So among those factors, you know, when you're referencing an older labor certification, once DOL certifies that that labor, um, it's kind of encapsulated to where those are the facts. Those facts have been found to be valid and established by DOL and USCIS has to accept uh, what DOL has certified. Now, whenever you're filing with U.S., the issue is still going to be, you know, uh, you know, your education, your uh, experience. Uh, have you maintained lawful status in the meantime? Has you know, hence has there been any gaps where you've lost I-94 or you've been um, out of status for a certain period of time? You know, that's that's one of the things they'll look at. And then uh, another thing would be, uh, you know, again, like what we just discussed, does the employer have the ability to pay the proffered wage? And these are the main points that, you know, USCIS is going to look when they're adjudicating the case. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, uh, Lucas. Just I want to uh, stress on the same I-140. The last... Uh, the last week's session, I heard the I-140 amendment, right? That is the first time I was here about the I-140 amendment. So in this scenario, if you want to downgrade EB, EB2 to EB3, it means, uh, what is the exact process? Even someone hearing is it uh, lawyers, attorneys are saying, maybe attorneys are, maybe they are getting the different uh, information from the different forum say uh, we can go for the amendment is that uh, is it true to we can go for the amendment or well are we that's we have that that would be using the the existing uh 
petition that's approved and you're saying I'm wanting to downgrade or change the visa category uh, is different than like what you would, you know, think of as far as the H1, like what we were talking about last week, it's different than like if you're thinking about an H1 amendment. Uh, basically, you're just taking the referenced case, like what we've been saying, and downgrading to a different category. Um, now, I want to be clear about this. A lot of people that ask this want to make sure that, you know, how is this going to impact both of my cases? How is this going to impact my future? What's going to happen if the dates move and I want to go ahead and use my EB2, I-140? Well, in this scenario, the safest, most efficient way of moving forward would be uh, to, quote unquote, use the uh, you know, amend whatever the existing I-140 is, but you're basically downgrading, you, utilizing the previously approved I-140 petition, okay? And when you do that, um, you know, we're referencing pretty much everything that's already in the record, and we're just verifying and validating that the petitioner still has the ability to pay, is still a proper position uh, that's open for future employment. And when we do this, um, you know, you're basically, the strategy is, and everything is strategy, the strategy would be that we're, we're using the filing date to get our foot in the door, maybe two or three, five, six, seven years ahead of where we would be with the final action date. So you have to ask yourself, what is the benefit? Well, the benefit is that we're starting the process sooner by downgrading to EB3. When we downgrade to EB3, we're going to have the ability to file and get um, employment authorization and advanced parole. Now, we might have employment authorization and advanced parole for two or three or four years before a final action date becomes close or current to what our priority date is. Now, why does this matter? Well, if you're planning for here and now, as far as a backup for any changes in policy, for any changes in the current, you know, visa, H-1B visa processes or how they're adjudicated, you know, you want to have a backup plan where, you know, if something bad happens where it's denied, you can at least use EAD or if you travel and you can't get stamped, you at least have advanced parole you can come back into the States. Again, and also something else I mentioned we're, you know, currently in the election cycle, um, you know, uh, voting started yesterday. And if, let's say, the parties change uh, in power here and the Democrats get in control of the president's, uh, the presidency and the Congress and also the Senate, then uh, what's going to happen is, I, you know, immigration comprehensive immigration reform is going to be high on the list of things to do in the first 100 days of the term, which would go until, you know, mid midsummer next year. And if that happens, if Congress has uh, two choices, if they're going to do anything, one would be that they're going to rewrite whatever the process might be. If they could rewrite, you know, the they could change the visas where there's no more H-1B visas. Maybe it's called something different. Maybe if you have a pending GC, they it's called like, you know, some in-between status. Uh, or Congress could just say, hey, look, we have all these people in a backlog. Uh, let's go ahead and issue 1 million, 2 million visas to clear up the backlog. So if you're in EB3 status and something like that were to happen, it doesn't matter if you have to change back to EB2 or not because everything would then – move to be current and then you would be able to say hey i already have a you know a pending adjustment of status application and you know eventually you would end up with the gc in hand so it's the strategy of saying i'm i'm starting the process and having the flexibility to know what i can do to change and move along the way to take advantage of whatever changes there might be in the law i hope that you know it's clear clear uh, as far as like why it's so important to do this yeah, yeah. I hope uh, it will clear. It means we are we are keep saying the same information in the last couple of uh, shows or a couple of weeks, but uh, still have some confusion and or uh, maybe missing some points. Uh, that's why we are keep asking and get more information. Uh, th this will help to uh, everyone to get the proper information. The Lucas, uh, 
one question about the i-94 recently i i, I got the information that so one scenario one H, h1b holder went to the out you know out, outside of united states he came back so at the time port of entry given the i-94 on passport expiration date mm-hmm. till passport expiration date but he had the h1b approval till 2022 uh, maybe october or october uh, september or october so he did not realize that he he thought is he is high 94 is till 2022 uh, september but recent changes uh, applying for 485 he checking all information he checked the i94 it got already expired of 40 days ago so in this case in this scenario i i think can you give the uh, information how he can uh, apply the 480 process without any issues right first i think he first uh, first i think he went went uh, went outside and get i94 then maybe is there any waiver fast yes. 40 days out of status ultimately is out of status right so is there any waiver form can you give give me the more information on this scenario yes so there is a waiver that uh, for employment based adjustment of status that if you're out of status for up to 180 days there's a waiver that will you know forgive that now that's something that the officers when they're adjudicating the case will do um if if that's needed now there's multiple things to that you could probably do to fix the i-94 and if it's already been fixed and it's only been 40 days of a you know um, of a gap uh typically that's not fatal to to the case um there's certain other if any other events arise where it does become an issue you know there's certain tools we have one of which being like a non pro talk provision to maybe fix this where it's no uh not any fault of, of the principal immigrants uh fault uh and maybe of course you know obviously now we have covid and everything else maybe it's it was difficult to leave or come back in or you know any one of these factors but if if the person hasn't fixed the issue yet um i would recommend doing that quickly uh, i had another call today with someone with a similar position and uh, if you don't have a visa a valid visa right now obviously you, you're going to have a hard time getting a visa unless you meet some of the uh exemption requirements dealing with you know working in a covid-19 or frontline uh workers um you could have your petitioner possibly refile you know and there's certain ways uh doing where you could reissue the i94 while you're still here uh so you know it's very important don't you know it it shouldn't hold up you filing for your uh adjustment but at the same time there is a um um uh, a certain amount of time that you have that, that that can be forgiven for being out of status and uh, again once you go past 180 days there's no additional waiver for that yeah in this scenario i saw a lot of cases it meant some misunderstanding about the i94 expiration mm-hmm. and port of entries some cbp officers uh, will give on uh, passport expiration date some are giving even passport is less than h1b approved i see those it giving the uh, h1 h1 uh, approved how many 3 years or whatever the period they they are giving uh, on uh, i94 so in this scenario if i want to extend the i94 what are the ways it means i hear only uh, just we go to the border any interested border and uh, get it man out and get in one mm-hmm. thing and second second one is we need to reapply the uh, maybe h1b or i94 extension is there any way to we can go to the port of entry uh, any port of entry within the united states airport uh, uh, port of entries and get extended i94 well that's a good question in the past obviously it was much easier you could go to you know any international airport go up to cbp and you know correct the issue now um most all major international airports are not allowing that 
uh, obviously here in, I know here in Dallas, New York, uh, other major airports, they're not doing that either. Um, you, what we've done here recently, and it, uh, as long as you can catch this before the, the updated I-94 expires, you can go um, to the port of entry itself. So here in Texas, we have Laredo. You, you don't actually have to leave the United States. You can go ask the officers to update the I-94 accordingly and uh, have it fixed that way. You could have your petition or whoever your employer is, they could go ahead, obviously, and file an extension uh, based upon that. And that's usually cheaper than traveling and going through the hassle of all that. So, you know, there's multiple ways of doing this and fixing it. And, and like I've said on other uh, shows, you know, everyone's case is unique. Um, you know, message boards and friends and all are great to for support and help going through the process. But you really want to um, evaluate each case based upon the facts surrounding that person. And we always say no two cases are the same. No two people have the same fingerprint. So it's very important to speak to, at that point, speak to an immigration attorney to try and help resolve that situation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. So, so uh, Lucas, wanna, uh, just, yeah. yes, yes, go ahead. I, I did want to bring up, since we did say extensions, um, I know last week we kind of touched on that some of the changes that were proposed with the new rule. Uh, there is some confusion out there. One rule has been, you know, uh, suspended by a court injunction as far as like using new forms, uh, new fees. Uh, and there's another new rule that's still uh, valid today that has increased the prevailing wages. And I know there's a lot of questions, confusions on uh, about that. Um, I know we spoke about that some last week, but uh, I, I did want to update. I, I know, you know, I'm a member of AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and I know of a couple of other organizations that are looking to uh, sue, you know, and, and have an injunction filed uh, suspending these, this new policy for the H-1Bs because I know most people who's working on, um, you know, a certain bill rate, you know, the, these new uh, um, policy changes, you know, require the payment higher than what the bill rate might be. And it could really affect people, especially if you're trying to change from one employer to another or file an amendment or, you know, something like that. They could, it could really impact you at this, at this time. Yes, Lucas. Actually, so it been, it been, it, it been already one week. Did you apply the new LCS recently, faster one, one week? Did you get any approval on this one? Uh, I haven't filed any LCAs. So last week I was filing like a madman until the <laughs> late into the night to make sure we had enough LCAs if there was an emergency transfer or something like that. We, we would have enough in our pocket to maybe make weather the storm, so to speak. Uh, for anything new coming up, we're trying to uh, hold as much as possible. You know, obviously, if we have to file, we'll do so and follow the you know the current regulations for that but uh if there's a way to postpone uh you know we have a little bit of a grace period as far as uh extensions go you know we, we can file up to six months in, in advance so we're kind of putting a, a hold on extensions at the moment to see what happens uh you know this week or, or by the end of next week hopefully with this uh injunction yeah for this uh, new changes almost uh the LCA amount, the firm amount, it almost changed about 50 percentile or 57 percentile EB2 or EB3. Just I uh, gone through some of uh, New Jersey area. The previous was 97,000. Now it is gone up to 152 or something. It's a big change. So okay. definitely very impacted to the H1 holders. Maybe hopefully. Uh, it it will get down to the rate part or rate part LCA rate part. So it went. So last week also we discussed about the third party employee. The USCS will approve only for one year. Is it true or is there any additional information on that one? 
Well, th- that is true. That's part of the new uh, rule that was kind of forced through quickly. Um, uh, now, that provision of the rule won't take effect until December. Uh, but, you know, we spoke about this probably one of, in one of our first shows, how there was a lawsuit that was settled earlier this year. Um, it, it eliminated the employer-employee relationship requirements from the new field memo. It also removed the provision for uh, third-party offsite employment to prove you have a specialty occupation available for that H-1B worker. And what it is is right now, as part of this rule, there you know they was trying to force back in in that provision. So, um, you know that that provision of this rule wouldn't take effect until December. But the wage rates at the moment have been elevated. Uh, you know, for wage level one, it's increased to the 45th percentile from the 17th, wage level two, 62nd percentile from the 34th, et cetera, et cetera. So you've seen drastic increases in this. Um, and, and like I said, I think it's a short term um, uh, issue that we have. Unfortunately, you know, we don't want it to impact anyone's life or business. But, um, you know, hopefully the next uh, week to 10 days, we'll have some answer or resolution to this. And it's important to remember that, you know, unfortunately, we are in an election year and these actions are sometimes taken to shore up their base or support, you know, to help get reelected with really. And I want to emphasize this, that the actions taken are pretty much uh, illegal in, in the sense that they haven't followed the proper rules uh whenever they they make these new rules they're supposed to be you know notice and comment period and and other provisions that are that are there for people to be able to prepare you know maybe make a comment have it to where um, there's more of a discussion rather than just issuing the rule so i'm pretty confident if and when something is filed uh, you know just like the last rule it's going to have the same uh, basis for an injunction uh with lack of notice or comment uh, you know, this hopefully will also be uh, uh, a part of an injunction here in the next 10 days or so. Okay, yeah, thank you. The Lucas here, uh, USC is saying that is a third party employee or third party consultant will get only the one year exp- one year approval. Do you have any, is when USC has defined who, who is the uh, third party, who is the employer, direct employer? Do you, is any information on that point? Well, there is information in that. And basically what they're saying is, you know, it's going back to the similar subject matter of saying, you know, do we have all the contracts between one party to another? Do we have the ability to show that the employer is not a quote unquote token employer that they really have the day-to-day management of that uh, third party, you know, offsite placement that they're in communication Um you know, there's a lot of factors like, similar to that that's involved. Like I said, it's kind of uh, reissuing the policy that they agreed to settle and uh, uh, rescind er- from earlier this year. So, uh, again, it's it's kind of a dog and uh, hor- or horse and pony show, I guess is what you'd call it. And it's just basically for, um, you know, supporting and, and rallying up the base uh, for these types of uh uh, policies. So there's really nothing there that, you know, I would see going forward in the future would be much of a anything to worry about. Okay. So, um, Lucas, now we can take some questions from the audience. Hey, uh, uh, viewers, if you have any questions, you can post or you can call to the show and you can ask your question. You can post on the Facebook page. Tell me another radio Facebook page and get more information from the attorney, Lucas. So just we, we can take a couple of calls and uh, we will discuss more points after that one. Uh, maybe the call name, uh, phone number last four is it six, uh, six, uh, four, six, three, one. Do you have any questions to ask to Lucas? Last four is four six three one. Okay, maybe other number five three eight seven. Last four is it? Do you have any questions? No. 
Hello, yes, go ahead. No, I'm good. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. The Lucas, uh, as a 485 process, uh, we are filling maybe four forms 485, I131, 765, 9444. So in 944, we are giving all information about public record and uh, assets and uh, debits, credits. So in this uh, form, do we want to give the the whole all family members in the form or it remains so while applying or while filling the one uh, i94 let's say is uh, the primary applicant is primary applicant need to fill the all household information in his applications or we need to maintain the sub each and every uh, form e each uh, household member needs to be included on the form. So if you have uh, yourself, a spouse, uh, let's say two kids, and then currently maybe your uh, one of your parents or both parents are living with you, that would be, you know, five people in the household and you would have to include all five people on the form. Now, each person who's applying for adjustment of status is going to have to submit their own I-944 form and you know, obviously, if you have your spouse and yourself and you're filing jointly and you share assets, you know, all that's fine. And then, of course, you would have to mention, uh, you know, if you had a child, you know, the child wouldn't be filing taxes, but they'd still have to show the household, you know, uh, assets and everything else. So it's kind of like a, you know, we have to include everyone, even though we're all referencing pretty much the same evidence uh, for multiple people. Okay. So, yeah, Lucas, I got I got a uh, question from Facebook, Manish Agarwal. In EB2, EB3 downgrade scenario, if a primary filer start using their EAD AP, and once the EB2 dates become more favorable, can the employer react to the H1B, H4 premium process? The one second. Yeah, premium and uh, then file the another AOS. Adjustment of status. So, uh, going over this, if you're going to downgrade, you're filing an EB3 to get um, advanced parole and e uh, employment authorization. You're asking, are you abandoning your H1 at that time and you're just going to work on EAD? Is that the question? I think Manish question, yes. Let's say is, uh, now we are applying to downgrading EB3. We are using uh, EAD and advanced payroll. So in future, if employer react to the H1B or H4, maybe premium process, uh, then file another invoice. So you probably want to maintain your status in H1 doing so, even if you have um, your EAD and advanced parole. And then what you would want to do is uh you know obviously see what the final action date's going to be for eb2 and then you could make the decision at that time if you want to upgrade uh and change visa category now for, when we're talking strategy about this you know we're talking about you know if your priority date's like 2013 uh and you're filing right now from eb2 to eb3 the final action date for eb2 is still 2009 so we're still at the current process and the rate of change for these, uh, the, the visas itself, it's still gonna be many years in, in advance. And I would say, um, you, you know, plan accordingly to what you wanna do. You wanna maintain your non-immigrant status in, in this type of scenario. And then you wanna make sure that uh, um, if, if you do make that decision in the future, that everything is planned accordingly to where you can, I guess, upgrade again uh, to EB2 from EB3. Okay, L Lugos, uh, we we are talking about the advanced payroll and uh, H one H one uh, the maintaining after getting the EAD, we can maintain the H one H one B application. Just I have a couple of questions on this one. Let's say we got EAD and uh, advanced payroll by this October visa bulletin. So I went to outside of you know United States of America. I come back. I have the two, two. One is the H1 
have next three years, maybe 2023, and also have the advanced payroll, right? So while port of entry, I use the advanced payroll, right? So once you use the advanced payroll, the still H-1B valid, first question. Uh, no, not to work on H-1. So when you work on H-1, you have to have two primary uh, requirements. You have to have uh, your passport and you have to have an unexpired I-94. So the I-94 can appear in two different ways. You can appear uh, to work on H-1B you know, once you enter the United States, you obviously you can go to the CBP website and you can print out your I-94. Uh, or if you stay here and you're here for more than that time on, on that and you file an extension, uh, the I-94 would then be on the I-797A. So in, in that regard, I've had some clients who've been here for, you know, five years and they've already had an extension uh, after entering so then you would reference the I-94 on the I-797A. So those are the requirements to work in H-1B. Uh, so obviously, if you enter with something other than your H-1B visa stamp in your passport, then you would not have an I-94 associated with an H-1B. And therefore, you would not be in H-1B status. Okay, that is my question. If we, if we all come to your know, states while using the advanced payroll, in advanced payroll, will uh, the CBP will give the I-94 or just uh, will give the stamp? How how does it work in port of entry? Well, advanced parole is basically saying that you're going to be permitted uh, to be paroled back into the United States. It's not a guarantee that you're always going to be admitted, uh, but it is something where they'll come, you know, when you come in, you'll obviously have a record uh, going through like with the stamp or whatnot. Uh, and it will be in the passport. It just won't be uh, a stamp associated with uh, H-1B. So obviously, if you come in that way, you'd want to, you know, probably change your status back to H-1 uh, with your employer if that's if that's your desire to stay in H-1B status. Okay, I think uh, it, Manish, you got the information from Lucas. Maybe if you have any additional information, maybe just uh, send an email to info at uh, bgimmblah.com. So uh, Lucas is ready to help to you. The Lucas, we, we got another question. Is all family-based extra spillover has been consumed on October 20 visa bulletin, or we can expect date or filing will be moving further in November, December? I was listening, okay, another talk, he was listening talk where they mentioned that only 26% has been used for this quarter for available quota. His priority date is December 17, Indian National. Do I stand a chance upcoming month? Upcoming month? Advance, uh, he is asking, if, if, uh, we already discussed about the, the future visa bulletins. So, He's saying that only the this quarter using only the 20, 26% of um, visa numbers, what is the chance in future to get more numbers and move to the till December 2017? Um, you know, to move that much to 2017, I don't think it's going to progress that much. Uh, and you have to remember, there's two things here. We're talking about the allocation of visas to be issued. Okay, we're so the Department of State can reallocate the visas that were unused from family based to apply to employment based, and we can predict what dates might move and how many visas will be utilized uh, for filing action for filing dates and final action dates. Now, again, like I said at the beginning of the show, let's say for example, it, miraculously it moves up to 2018 this year. Uh, well, USCIS might be inundated with so many applications that there's probably no chance that they would allow, uh, you know, 100,000 applications to be filed, you know, in that short of a time, uh, because just the logistics of that is probably impossible for them to handle at the current employment levels, so, or staffing levels, so they'd have to either increase the staffing and get, a, you know, temporary workers to assist with this, or, um, 
something would have to be done. So, I mean, I would say prepared and everything and, and just obviously stay informed with our radio, with our uh, Facebook show. Uh, but as far as like specifically being able to predict, even if I could predict that, you know, 2017 December is going to be, you know, available in, in April of next year, you know, USCIS might not accept the filing date. They might reference the final action date. So, you know, something we just have to stay prepared and, and just kind of update on a month to month basis and see how things are, are progressing. I hope that helps. Okay. The Lucas already we discussed of the filing date and final action. The how USCIS uh, changed, uh, it went to the priority on the filing date and move for how many last six, maybe from since 2014 to till date, maybe six years. The how many times it moved forward, move, move, moved on uh, filing date to apply the 485. Maybe October 2020 is the one. Is there any? previous visa bulletins well yeah so every year we you know every october is pretty much if you can think it's jan 1st of any year it's the beginning right now today's the 14th correct 14 uh, yes. means for 14 days into the new year here and uh, just like I don't know if you have if you have many contacts or follow many people like with EB one. You know, usually by the time you get to June or July, you know everything just pretty much stops and, and is at a halt until the beginning of the next fiscal year. So, you know, to answer that question, that's when everything goes back. You can say name and uh, you can ask questions if you have anyone. Hey, uh, my name is my name is Praveen Guram. And, yes, Praveen. Uh, my question is, <clears throat> yeah, now that uh, you know the attorney just raised a good point where he said that because they do not have that many people, they may not move the filing dates that advance. What happens to all the people who have already filed? Then that happened like in 2012 when the dates had moved till you know May 2010 and then they had reverted back. So all those people who are on uh, you know EAD and advanced parole since then, will the dates move quickly? So that's a good question. Um, because the you dates know, had moved till May 2010. Yeah. yeah. So we have to look at the final the, action. Long that... story short is yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. The final action date is only till September 2009, but the dates had earlier moved till May 2010. So they already have the applications with them, uh, you know, in their inventory. That's my point. So because they have it in their inventory, will all those people get a quick green card? Well, it, it's not so much a quick green card. So whenever you're referencing that, part of the strategy on the, the final action date would be, let's say you have... December 2009 EB2, uh, you know, and you're pending and languishing away, you know, waiting years and years with EAD and advanced parole, you could downgrade to EB3 uh, and the final action date would be current. So when people do that and there's that type of maneuvering, visas, you know, become uh, consumed, you know, so to speak. So, you know, the dates are always having to be adjusted in that regard. So, just because like right now final action date for EB3 is ahead of EB2 it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay that way because a lot of people are going to you know take advantage of the situation and, and um, you know like I said it all comes back to planning and being prepared you know to take advantage of whatever might come up so uh, when that happens there's a lot of uh, you know visas that might be available and then once they're used they might not you know, EB2 might overtake EB3 in the next six months, if that makes any sense. Thank you. You're yeah, welcome. Thanks. thanks for calling. Yeah. yeah, we can take another call. Yeah, go for it next.
Do you have any questions from phone? Okay. The Lucas, uh, we got a uh, another question from Facebook. The Sarish, uh, Sarish, he had a poor I one fourteen EB two in twenty twelve. If uh, if he downgrade to EB three and file adjust advanced payroll and adjustment of status altogether, will get EAD only upon approval of I one forty downgraded. No, saying so. No, so you can file concurrently, which is what we would do in a downgrade. And if you're able to also concurrently file your adjustment of status, as soon as you file that, you have the uh, ability to also file for advanced parole and uh, employment authorization. So, you know, if for whatever reason in the future the case is rejected or, you know, once you get all the receipts for all the cases and, and your case isn't rejected, then you're employment authorization and advanced parole. Now, hopefully I-140 gets approved. Um, and if so, then you'll be able to keep renewing your, you know, EAD and advanced parole each year. Um, and your actual application is not going to really be adjudicated or no one's going to really work on that until the final action date becomes current. So what you're getting is you're getting the opportunity to go ahead and file uh, concurrently so you can get that you know EAD card in hand in advance parole uh, and then you know just wait for the opportunity to get the GC whenever your final action date might become current. Okay the Sirish I think uh, you got the information from the Lucas. The Lucas uh, I have the, another question uh, in October the process let's say is a 485 is a pure employee process it's not employer process Let's say if we want to submit the checks, in this process, we are downgraded to EB2, EB3. It means we are applying the fresh I-140. So mm -hmm. in, in this case, the check, the employer check is okay, just we need to, em, employee checks is okay, or we need to ask to the employer to provide the check for the $700 or some $700 to apply the 480, uh, I-140. The 485, so, I understand we uh, the employee can give the checks. Just I have a question about the I-140 application. For this, the check is supposed to the employer. Either one is fine. So either party can file the I-140 or pay for the fees. Uh, obviously, petitioner has to sign and file the I-140 officially. Uh, where it comes in to where the petitioner has to cover the cost and expense would be if you're filing the labor. So advertising costs, um, other attorney fees, uh, things like that involving the labor itself is where the attorney has to accept, uh, you know, the, the payment from the employer only. I think uh, Ranjit joined the call. Ranjit, do you have any questions? Uh, maybe we can close as soon as possible. If you have any questions, you can, you can ask. Ranjit? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, uh, yeah, one second. So I have a question about, uh, um, the medicals, like, is it, uh, um, like, uh, mandatory to submit now, or do we, we have an option to submit during the interview process? You have the option to submit during the interview process. Very good question. Medicals are very expensive. Um, if you're relying on the, the filing date to file your case, you're still possibly years away. Uh, you're going to have to redo your medicals in the future. And if you have a family of three, you know, that could be easily six, seven hundred dollars. Uh, and I mean, there's no point in doing that. Uh, USCIS actually, you know, it's it ha provides that notice on the website if you want to verify uh, that you medicals are no not required at the time of filing. And uh, what you'll actually get is a, I had one here on my desk, uh, but you'll just get a, you know, just a, a letter in the mail saying, you know, bring this with you uh, at the time of the, your interview appointment. Okay. Okay. The only, the only reason why I was debating whether or not to have the medical snob is like, you know, one of the attorney calls, they were suggesting to do it now only for the reason, uh, let's say like, um, um, 
the USA has obviously issues in RFE um, because of the pending medicals and uh, um, uh, while the time like in, in the process of, that you're working on the medicals like late with okay yeah. uh, they were saying that you might lose the opportunity that's the only scenario uh, I, I i think that that's any cause and that I don't know who said that, but I don't think that that's realistic. Um, I, I think that you have to remember Donald Trump uh, about three years ago man, made it mandatory for anyone adjusting status to go through an interview process. Okay. So once you're in the queue for the interview, having a medical or not having a medical is not going to impact where you are. Okay. If, if it's a first in, first out system, And let's say, what what city do you live in right now? I'm in Austin. You're in Austin. So you would probably, uh, I think you would go to the Austin field office, that or San Antonio. I can't remember which. Anyway, you would go there. So it's a first in, first out system. If uh, I'm here in Dallas, obviously there's more people here. The line would be longer for me to have my appointment. So it has nothing to do with the medical that it has to do with, you know, where you're scheduled for your appointment and how soon you have the interview. And all they're going to do is send you, uh, I'll show you real quick. Hold on one second. That's fine. So mark out the, name so you'll get a notice like this that will basically show uh you know you need to bring your um medical with you right and then you, <laughs> at the same time make sure no one can see the names you'll have it like you know an appointment notice like this that will show you the date and every and, and times to arrive at the appointment and uh, and and they literally mail this at the you know within a day or so of each other and they'll just say hey look you don't have this bring this uh among other information that you might have uh with you or that might be required for that at the time so not having a medical now has no impact whatsoever if the dates retrogress because you have to go to an interview if that makes sense oh okay okay yeah that makes sense so if i'm honest if i'm understanding it right so not having a medical will not trigger an RFE. You would uh, you would still have an option to submit it during uh, during the interview it, process, right? Exactly. It's not so much an RFE in the sense of H one B RFE. We you know that you say RFE and that always triggers a certain reaction <laughs> to people, especially if you're on H one B you know status. You know, uh, it's, it, what they're saying is, uh, hey, don't forget to bring this to the appointment. If you reference the website, uh, USCIS.gov, uh, it, it, it even specifically states that there, that you know you don't need to file this at the time of filing. It's not going to impact your case. And that, uh, that's just, you know, it's inaccurate information of what you received. I don't know if you heard it out of context or, or what the situation might be, but that's, that's incorrect. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. That makes sense, complete sense. And uh, yeah, I... Was, I heard it in a couple of attorney calls so i may not have understood uh, uh, completely but uh, no, whatever but you said makes sense thank you so that's much. what that's you're most welcome that's why we're here that's why hopefully people can tune in every week that you know we try and we don't always have a hundred percent you know uh, knowledge of everyone's scenario or, or background but uh you know as far as the general guidelines i mean uh, we try and provide people with what they need to know so mm-hmm. they make wise decisions so thanks for calling in and if you need any more clarification you can always email or or follow up with me uh, offline okay sure definitely thank you thanks 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 thanks, thanks for the call yeah yeah yes lucas uh, i think uh, we are came to end the show almost one hour so as we discussed so far, apart from this, do you have any additional information you want to share to today's session? I do want to share uh, in the sense that 
I have spoken to, I probably have uh, 50 people that have decided to say, I want to wait and see what the next piece of bulletin is going to be before I make a decision on what to do. And, you know, and that's fair. Um, Hopefully everyone has a chance to get their place in line, you know, in the next few months and hopefully everything continues progressing, um, you know, for everyone to be included. But just remember, not all attorneys will accept uh, new cases all the way up to the end. Uh, be, stay in contact with your attorney, uh, even if you haven't hired them yet to start the process. Let them know what your thoughts or ideas might be so they're not, you're not planning on hiring them. And then that attorney says, no, I can't take any more cases at this time. That's number one. Number two, if the new visa bulletin comes out and you're planning on saying, okay, now I'm going to file EB2 because instead of doing a downgrade, you know, be prepared to, to know that if USCIS receives a large amount of uh, applications, that there's a very good chance that they could say, okay, now for this visa category, we're only going to accept, um, you know, the final action date, which would mean that you might have to wait another six months for the opportunity to file. So just, you know, take advantage of the situation. If, if, if everyone's situation is unique to them, you know, uh, some people it's not as important uh, as it is to others. So just, you know, A, number one, keep, keep in contact with the attorney if you're still on the fence about what you want to do. And B, uh, don't make plans based upon one set of information because uh, just because a visa bulletin says something doesn't mean that you're going to be able to file in the upcoming month. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Lucas, for more information on current uh, October visa bulletin and process. So thanks for giving answers from questions. So yes, um, always thank you for you giving uh, such a opportunity to come to live and uh, giving more information to our the platform for this platform. So. The listeners and viewers are we are continue to this show every Wednesday central DM, central uh, 6 p.m. USA time. So you can utilize this platform and you can you can post your question. Maybe you can give the your topic in advance. We, we can able to bring more information on your topic. Maybe you, you can connect the we open the conference call. Maybe you can connect to a conference call and you can call and uh, get more information. We are trying to give the more information so that you can uh, you can understand the immigration system and uh, you should have the better way or uh, better in better situation to decide your scenario in the right direction. That is our intention. The Lucas is uh, always help to is ready to help to everyone in this community. So I'm working last three to two to two end of three years to Lucas is very helpful. If you have any questions, you can post on Facebook page, uh, Telvinar Radio Facebook page, or um, Burgos and Garrison Facebook page, or you can send an email to info at the rate immlaw.com. So today we are ending the show. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much for being with Telvinar Radio and uh, helping to our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For- Thank you for having me, Pinkat. And we'll, uh, again, remind everyone, like and follow both uh, Telugu NRI Radio and Burgos and Garrison Law on Facebook. And we'll, you know, update in, in between our shows during the week if there's any major changes uh, to any law or uh, anything that takes place of importance. So, again, uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation. And I look forward to, you know, our show next week. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Being with uh, Telugu and Radio, signing off. Very good.